In this, the last of 10 lectures, I'd like to bring to your attention a few key differences between inhalational and intravenous anaesthetic drugs with respect to their kinetics. First, let's discuss induction. Now, you may recall the intravenous induction is characterized by a spike in plasma concentration followed by a washout curve, and that on the other hand, inhalational induction is modeled using a wash-in curve. Here's the thing. For inhalational induction, we know for certain the value of the asymptote towards which the partial pressure will tend. That's the dotted line. That's what we dial on the, on the vaporizer. On the other hand, with intravenous induction, we really have no idea what the peak plasma concentration of intravenous bolus will be. Now, of course, it'll be a very rare day that you see anybody induced for a major trauma uh, using gas induction, uh, but this is a difference which is well worth bearing in mind. Much is made of this comparison in the Hemings and Egan chapter on intravenous pharmacokinetics, which I referred to in the very first lecture, the recommended reading lecture. So, if intravenous induction is such an uncertain event, then why do we almost always induce anesthesia by the intravenous route when we have the choice? The reason is that with intravenous induction, we can almost eliminate the time spent in the dangerous plane of anesthesia described as the stage of excitement by Arthur Goodell. This is the period of time during which we see coughing, breath holding, bronchospasm, laryngospasm, vomiting and aspiration. During induction of anesthesia with diethyl ether, I've been told it takes about 10 minutes to pass through that stage. With a nitrous oxide and sevofluorine induction in a five-year-old, it might be a couple of minutes. But during a rapid sequence induction with propofol, it's all over in a matter of seconds. I expect there are other reasons why we prefer rapid inductions, but the kinetic explanation is probably the best one. Here's another question. In the event of sudden stimulation resulting in your patient moving, which is the more appropriate immediate action? A, a bolus of IV anesthetic agent, or B, an increase in the concentration of volatile anesthetic agent being delivered into your circuit, along with an increase in the fresh gas flow rate? The answer is clearly the intravenous option, and once again, the relevant curves provide the answer. We can dump intravenous drugs directly into the circulation and raise the plasma concentration as quickly as we like, whereas for inhalational agents, drug enters the body firstly by diffusion across a membrane down a concentration gradient. And that's also assuming that we could increase the concentration in the lungs rapidly, which we can't do. The same is true if we want to reduce the depth of anesthesia quickly. With an intravenous infusion, we can simply cease administration and the plasma concentration will fall. It is very cumbersome to do the equivalent with inhalational anesthesia. This rapid titratability of intravenous infusions is a crucial advantage that the intravenous route has over the inhalational route. Next, I'd like to discuss with you the difference in the kinetics of propofol and volatile agents with respect to emergence. I draw your attention again to the fact that the decrement times for propofol are said to balloon out during prolonged anesthesia. This is the barrow that one of the examiners was pushing in a short answer question on this topic from a few years ago. Now it's certainly true that patients can emerge from sedation pretty quickly after several days on propofol. Many of us will have seen that in the ICU. But I expect this is because the plasma concentrations in these patients doesn't get very high. As we have seen already, there's a lot of discrepancy between the decrement times for the various drugs. None of these numbers is from any one particular source. They're just what I've committed to memory based on what I've read. Here's another question. For which of the general anesthetic drugs can we accelerate offset and why? The answer, of course, is that we can accelerate volatile anesthetic excretion by increasing minute ventilation and increasing fresh gas flow rate, of course, but there is nothing we can do to accelerate the offset of the effect of propofol other than simply wait for the body to do its job. Here's a follow-up question. Can any of you think what environmental implications this difference might have? This is my thought. The fact that volatile anesthetics are excreted unchanged means that at some point 
we may be able to capture and recycle them. This may involve condensation by cooling, or it may be something like an encapsulating molecular lattice. Either way, I wouldn't write off inhalational anaesthetics from the future of anaesthesia, at least not yet. Here's a question for you. Why is it that high lipid solubility correlates with rapid onset of effect for intravenous anaesthetics, whereas for inhalational anaesthetics, high lipid solubility correlates with slower onset of effect? What's with that? I would say that the reason is that the onset of effect is subject to different limiting factors. For inhalational anaesthetics, the limiting factor is the rate at which the partial pressure in the blood can rise. It's a saturation phenomenon. For intravenous drugs, the major limiting factor is the rate at which the drug can pass from the plasma into the effect site. The reason for this disparity is that the mechanisms of delivery are fundamentally different. Whereas sevoflurane must diffuse across a membrane, we can dump propofol into the circulation as quickly as we like. In summary, the mechanisms by which we deliver inhalational and intravenous anaesthetics are fundamentally different, and this has implications for clinical practice. For instance, the peak concentration that can occur during an inhalational induction is defined whereas after an intravenous induction, we are completely in the dark. On the other hand, the rapid titratability of intravenous anaesthetics remains a distinct advantage. Given that this is the last lecture in the series, I thought I would leave you with a few final thoughts. The first is that it's essential to understand pharmacokinetics if we are going to administer drugs in an intelligent fashion. When an induction is unstable, we should seek to improve our understanding of the drugs and the patient before we blame the pharmacogenomic boogeyman. The second comment I would make is that the compartment models we use are ingenious and very useful tools, but it's important to understand their limitations. Lastly, I'd like you to have some appreciation of the differences between inhalational and intravenous anaesthetic agents, and maybe even the beauty of each. Thank you.